Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're watching a special edition of The Listening Post. We're devoting almost the entire broadcast to an interview with Academy Award-winning film director Oliver Stone. But we're not going to talk about Hollywood or the movies. We're focusing, as we always do, on the media. The Venezuelan president has become more dangerous to the U.S. than Fidel Castro ever was. Muitas vezes aqui na América do Sul. Stone's new documentary, South of the Border, is a one-hour, 18-minute long look at Latin America. It zeroes in on Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez and the media war he has fought both against domestic political opponents and news outlets in the United States. The media has disproportionate control of the information in our era. Stone also talks about the media with political leaders in Argentina. Le contaba la otra vez a periodistas que me interrogaban. Ecuador. Rafael Correa, does he still think he's, he's a favorite of the American media? And Bolivia. El peor enemigo que tengo son los medios de comunicación. Oliver Stone on Latin America and the media this week on The Listening Post. You mean you go to sleep reading this book? I mean, how boring can you get? Venezuela is a country we've reported on extensively on this program, not just because the Chavez government, with its leftist policies, has been in a war of words with Washington ever since the early days of the Bush administration, not just because of the oil politics at play, but primarily because of the media story there. In 2002, President Chavez was temporarily deposed in a coup in which the Venezuelan media played a significant part. Some TV channels sided with coup leaders to try to topple a democratically elected president. The coup was attempted with, at the very least, the tacit support of Washington and, more to the point, the vocal support of some American news outlets, including Fox News and the New York Times. Some of those news organizations still routinely call Hugo Chavez a dictator, a charge that is simply not backed up by the facts. In his new documentary, South of the Border, Oliver Stone looks at the media landscape in Venezuela and the way the story continues to be reported and often misreported outside of Latin America. Stone's documentary is getting mixed reviews in the U.S., but consider the source. Many of those reviews are in newspapers the director has taken aim at in the film. I sat down with Oliver Stone in London. Oliver Stone, thanks for talking to us here at The Listening Post. South of the Border, I want to talk about the opening of the film because Oftentimes, a filmmaker, a novelist, a documentary maker really struggles to find a way to open a film. But Fox News kind of helped you out there, didn't it? <laughs> yeah. Fox and Friends, it was called, and yeah. it's a stupid show. Something that I never knew was that I knew there were some dictators around the world. Sure. But did you know? They make a lot of commentary. They're very effective. They reach a wide audience. And they're and the typical. You find it probably hilarious in Europe, but in, in, the, in the U.S., I think that they're a rather typical show. Hugo Chavez now admitting in a speech yeah. that went widely undocumented, by the way, that he chews cocoa every morning, and he also eats something called cocoa paste, I think which, it's by the way, is addictive. And he gets it from the dictator in Bolivia. The people talk superficially in those kind of tones. And it's a shame that so much of our impression of South America comes from that kind of... Uh, Superficiality. What did you say? Coca. It is coca. Oh, coca. Coco. Oh, would... coca would be fine. Listen. <laughs> I don't know my. I don't know my narcotics as well. well as see, I it's a shame. For a moment, Gretchen, when you just said coco, uh, I, I'd imagine people all across America just spin up cocoa puffs. Yeah. They thought they were going to get a high out of it today. Uh, I'm, I'm an Ovaltine guy, but that's for another time. Uh, but what you're saying is, I'm re I read that too, and then it, they were people. I guess the reporters went on to define what is he talking about. He gets his cocoa paste. Coca. Coca. Co I got you going down you, the coca paste. Now from Bolivian dictator. Is he a dictator too? What was it specifically about that clip, what they were saying, that you felt captured the media side of the story you wanted to tell to the extent that you were eager to start the film? Oh, come on. Listen, there's, that clip shows you the irresponsibility of the media. They're just throwing out words. They don't even know what they're talking about. Dictator, the word dictator is, is semantics. Like Noam Chomsky says, it's insane. The man the U.S. describes as nothing short of a dictator. Venezuela's combative, anti-American president. He's been called a dangerous influence in Latin America. And his close ties with Cuban dictator Fidel Castro didn't help. The word dictator, I've been in Eastern Europe. I, was, uh, I did a movie, I did a screenplay about the dissident movement in Russia. I was in every country. I know what a dictatorship is. And when you have censorship, I know what that is. You know, that was horrible in those days, in the 80s, 70s even. But now... This is a joke in South America. I mean, this guy, Chavez, as well as these other leaders, were all elected transparently. They were monitored by international organizations, Chavez the most of all. 
and he was elected by two large majorities in two, uh, two times, in 2006 and in 2000. So, you know, the issue of dictator is thrown away like that. First of all, strong man is a concept that's ingrained in the American consciousness, but a strong man needs to, you have to have strong people to rule, otherwise you're not going to get anything done in countries like South America because it's a rough place to play. When you, when you set out to make a film about Latin America, did you realize even then that the media would end up being as big a component in the final product as they turned out? So much of the story doesn't get out in the United States or in South America or anywhere because of the media. The media has enormously a disproportionate control of the information in our era. It has a lot to do with uh, the, what Orwell wrote about in the 1940s. It was, it's reached a place of where the media is truly a force for, for change and also for uh, stopping change. And it's, it's reached a place where it's dangerous. You know, I don't know what's going to happen. I think most of the changes in South America came about in spite of the fact that there was a media opposition. Sacaram que era uma ilusão e ignoraram o show. Lula deixou de ser o cara do Obama. Because most of the people who were affected by the economic changes of that era were not reading or looking at uh, the media in, on television. They did not believe it. Maybe they flipped this soap opera dial and they watch a soap opera or they watch an entertainment that's easy on the eyes, but most people, most change is not because of media, it's in opposition to it. A lot of people with surface knowledge of the Venezuela story, which is, let's face it, just about everybody, um, <laughs> because they're getting that information from the media, they look at Chavez and all they know is, they may know, yeah, there are some people on the opposition side who own some TV channels, but they say, but he runs state-run television. Para que aprenda cuál es la realidad de lo que él está viviendo y la realidad de América Latina. Y la realidad del mundo. And he goes on that Allo Presidente for like 13 hours at a time, sounds like yeah. Brezhnev, yeah. circa 1974. Yeah. What's he got to worry about? Yeah. But the landscape is a little bit tilted, Quite isn't Quite different, it? no. Most people, uh, Chavez, I talked to Chavez about it, and I said, why do you do them? You're, you're, too, uh, you're, too, ob you're too much in the public eye. And he's, he says there's no other way for me to get out there because essentially Two stations out of 48, two television stations are run by the government, the, other, the others are run by private. And he can't get private time and any good uh, fair reading on private. So he does it, and he does it too much, and I think it's a mistake. But he believes in it, and he's still popular, very popular. He won a huge election by 63 percent in uh, 2006. So it's working for him. Yeah, for now. Although there's no question that, and we have criticism in the movie. Nestor Kirshner says it very clearly. He says, "I like Hugo. I think he's a great, uh, forceful man, but he's. I wish he'd groom a successor, ten successors." Es lo que yo siempre le digo a Hugo también. Esto lo hago con total objetividad. Yo tengo una gran relación con Chávez, mi amigo. Pero le digo con Trujillo colectivamente. So that there would be a, a process that would continue after he goes. You see, the problem is that he, he magnifies the opposition. So the opposition makes it a battle about Hugo Chavez as a, as a quote, strong man, or, whereas the real battle is between right and left in South America. Sure. But they always manage to funnel it to Chavez. Chavez, like Castro. The, the, the real revolution in Cuba was between the right and the left but they made it about Castro, and the U.S. continues to do that. You, you, you took the decision that you wanted to go down and tell this story without talking to opposition figures right. so much, and you knew when you did yeah. that 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 was going to open up Oliver Stone, who was already, let's face it, a controversial guy, to criticism from the anti-Chavez, um, the anti-leftist forces. Tell me a little bit about that decision and whether you, you still would stick to it and do it the same way. I don't know how else we, else we could have done it. First of all, there is a tremendous amount of criticism in the movie. You have to, it's historical criticism. It goes into the, the 2002 coup. It shows you all the, which was a media coup against, uh, against Chavez. It was called the media coup because it was instigated by the media. And we go and we interview people who hate him and who say horrible things about him on the United States television and in Venezuelan television. We show people in the street. But because we don't follow it up into 2009, we're not journalists, we're not chasing the news up to that point. We, we've been talking about a historical incident. 
Uh, what I'm reacting to is a huge amount of negative criticism of Chavez and saying, look, look, let the man speak in his own words. La causa de la, del golpe en Venezuela. The cause y de la invasión a Irak. Coup in Venezuela and the Iraq invasion. La misma. It's petroleum. So this is the contribution of our documentary. It allows these leaders who are unknown to the United States people to speak in their own words and, see, and explain themselves as they see themselves without criticism. Los cambios son de tener una administración honesta transparencia, que las instituciones recuperen su dignidad. If I can be a prosecuting journalist, as I have been with Castro at times, mm -hmm. you can make it very uncomfortable for them, and you won't hear them what they want. And I think this is an opportunity. And also, at the same time, by the way, I'm showing a movement that has worked economically. And so I'm going off statistics now, yeah. World Bank statistics. Yeah. These are not contested statistics. So I'm saying, look, essentially these economies have worked. When we come back after the break, I want to talk a little bit more about Hugo Chavez, but also talk about a couple of the other Latin leaders you spoke to down there, sure. Correa and Morales. Sure. Welcome back. In the second part of our interview with Oliver Stone, we look beyond Venezuela and talk about some other Latin American leaders he spent time with. South America is a huge and diverse continent, but it's striking how the same media issues cropped up, whether Stone was in Ecuador, Bolivia, or even in the deep south, Argentina. We also talked about one of the biggest challenges the director faced with this documentary, distribution, how to get his film in front of his target audience, Americans. With this film, you were attacked by the New York Times correspondent, Larry Roter afterwards and you had put in the film the editorials that the Times yeah. uh, had run the editorial immediately after the coup in 2002 much of the US media welcomed the coup the New York Times editorial board wrote Venezuelan democracy is no longer threatened by a would-be dictator you ran that clip where you have the coup official talking about some of the measures they're taking se destituyen de sus cargos ilegítimamente ocupados al presidente y demás magistrados del Tribunal Supremo de Justicia. So what he's saying is, we're shutting down the National Assembly, we're shutting down the Election Commission, we're firing the Supreme Court. And the New York Times' reaction to that was, thank goodness they did this, yeah. otherwise it could have been a dictatorship. It's really, it really tells you a lot. And uh, by the way, that aspect of the film was not shown or covered in the United States. Most of the reviews don't mention that the United States was essentially behind the coup and knew about it in advance. This is new information. And, yeah. it's, but, and uh, Larry Roder of the New York Times is one of those type of people. He's worked for the Times a long time as a bureau chief, and he's definitely what they call a neoconservative. And when he went after you, did you get the feeling that he was attacking the film or that he was defending the New York Times? Don't know. I can't tell you on that because the New York Times, as you have, did acknowledge in its editorial, that it was it had been wrong to to uh, print that editorial. It was a grudging apology, but it was an apology nonetheless. The New York Times editorial board seemed embarrassed for supporting the coup and its government. Roter didn't even uh, didn't even acknowledge that it was uh, the New York Times, his own paper, had accepted that it was a coup. So he was against the policy of the editorial page on that. But his argument is that uh, Chavez is essentially uh, accumulating power and trampling on the Constitution. It's the usual, the usual uh, way that you undermine these people. You mention human rights. You talk about all the problems. But you, I think he misses the bigger issue, which is the the improvements that have been made in that country the big picture. And I think uh, the New York Times on, and the Washington Post on South America and Central America over the last century has been m mostly against, on the wrong side of history, they've been against reform. And I think the New York Times, despite its liberal reputation, has been generally against the poor peoples of the earth. Okay, but at least the New York Times after Iraq, after we weapons of mass destruction, after the misreporting of all kinds of intelligence, at least they came out and they formally apologized. There was a grudging apology that if you read between the lines was in that That's correct. Yeah. But they will not apologize for their misreporting, uh, or what a lot of people call their misreporting, of Latin America. What do you think is keeping them from doing that? I think that there's a bias. I think that it's been our backyard. I think there's a Monroe Doctrine. I think there's a racial element to this. I think that because it's Hispanics, that there's a sense that they, we condescend to them as opposed to mutual respect. It's the whole concept of empire uh, 
Richard. I think that empire is acceptable to the New York Times. We are an empire. We have certain rights, and we, and we have to enforce those rights. In order to enforce the empire, we have the right to go to war, include, including preemptively, by the way. I don't think that they differ very much from the Cheney Doctrine on preemption. I think that they assume that if uh, some candidate comes along who professes communism, socialism, or any kind of social change that upsets the course of the empire, the interests of the empire, that person is suspect. Rafael Correa is now being cast as one of the potentially bad left. Rafael Correa, president of Ecuador, tells you when you say, you know, there are a lot of people in the U.S. media who don't like you. He comes out and said, Con todo respeto, conociendo a la prensa norteamericana, estaría más preocupado cuando hable bien de mí. Statement of fact on his part, or do you think he's making a rhetorical point? No, I think there's been negative articles about Correa and the changes. He did nationalize some things, and he also has improved the economy of Ecuador, and so has Mor Morales, too, has been extremely uh, criticized in the United States, although we don't really know who he is. Detenerme, encarcelarme. He is a, the first Indian president of South America, Evo Morales. He reminds me of Benito Juarez, his quote, uh, poor Mexico, you know, so close to the United States, so far from God. Uh, <laughs> but, but also, he's quite savvy on media, too, isn't he, Morales? Los medios que van a siempre tratar de criminalizar la lucha contra el neoliberalismo, contra el colonialismo y contra el imperialismo. Sitting there in La Paz, he knows what the U.S. media are up to. Casi normal. Acá el peor enemigo que tengo son los medios de comunicación. Listen, uh, Morales has, has uh, suspended uh, relations with the United States because he doesn't trust them. He, think, uh, he threw out the DEA. He doesn't do business with the IMF. He feels that the, the DEA is a form of sabotage. It's a form of control. The military bases are, uh, to him are, an, are anathema because they're a form of control. So is the drug war. He, he questions the whole thing. He's very radical, Morales. The media is totally owned by the rich people and they constantly attacking, attacking. In Argentina, it's so horrific that Nestor Kirchner and his wife, Cristina, Cristina Kirchner has passed, they've gotten through the Congress, uh, a media law breaking up these monopolies. The Grupo Clarín is the group that they're yeah, going after. Clarín yeah. controls so much of Argentina. Le contaba la otra vez a periodistas que me interrogaban, dice que Hugo Chávez quiera exportar su revolución o su cambio o su socialismo a toda América Latina y esto no puede ser así, me decían ¿no? los periodistas europeos. De esa manera piensan los que son colonialistas. Brasil es la misma historia. Y también Paraguay, que es donde interviewed Lugo, el priest. So these countries are fighting against violent, uh, vociferous opposition in the media. Aquí hay un grupo que se ha privilegiado históricamente del gobierno. De lo, de los recursos del Estado. Let me end by asking you about distribution, because any time a filmmaker makes a film, distribution is of paramount importance. Yes. You've had some struggles in the United States on this side. Yes. Uh, I understand it's going better in Europe and elsewhere. Um, what do you think your problem is in the U.S.? Is it ideological? Is it commercial? It's both. You know, it's hard to get stories about South America out there. I did a movie called Salvador years ago with James yeah, Woods. Great film. It did get attention from the critics, and, and it was nominated for Oscars, but it was not commercially successful until video. I would say this about our, our film. We did get it out. South of the border, we never expected anything. We got it out on Showtime. We, theatrically, we have a limited distribution, artistic one. In the U.S. Yeah, which is amazing. But it's, you know, it's obviously been criticized across the board. And I say movie critics, too, not just the New York Times guy. Sure. And, you know, the movie critics, even if they like the movie, what they'll say, they'll say, listen, I enjoyed it, I learned some things, but obviously it's, you know, agitprop from Oliver Stone, or it's, it's propaganda with rose-colored glasses. Now, they don't know anything about South America. The reason they're saying that is to protect themselves. They said, I don't want to be a fool here. I can't say anything all positive about this because it's, maybe it's all true, but I can't believe that it's true. There's got to be a bad side because the lie has been repeated and repeated and repeated about how these people are bad. So you can't go all the way and support the film. That's what I call a, a missile shield. Uh, you know, Reagan, when he put up the Star Wars, it was to shoot down anything that was incoming, right? But it doesn't work, missile shield. It was the idea. But the media works as a missile shield because it shoots down anything that goes too far off its radar.
These rogue dictators like Chavez. If you said you hate Hugo Chavez or Fidel Castro, I'd say I hate those guys. And the effects of Chavez, his war against America, could eclipse those of 9-11. That's, that's where Orwell was right. You have a memory hole, and everything goes in, and it's all mixed up. And peace is war, war is peace, freedom is slavery, slavery is freedom. That's where people get confused. But the interests of the people are forgotten because they don't have access to the media. They're poor people of the world. Oliver Stone, thanks for talking to us. Thank you, Richard. Appreciate it. Finally, we're sticking with our Latin American theme for our web video of the week. Isla Presidencial is a Venezuelan satire from a site called El Chiguere Bipolar. It's an animated show that lives on the web partly because it pushes some political boundaries. The show is a takeoff of the U.S. TV series Lost, except the 12 lost souls are Latin American political leaders. Messrs. Chavez and Morales are friends from the left. Colombia's right-wing leader, Alvaro Uribe, is a bit of a straight arrow. And even King Juan Carlos of Spain makes an appearance. Millions of web hits suggest that there's a big appetite for this show right across South America. We'll see you next time at The Listening Post. Así, señoras y señores, damos por finalizada la 74 ª Cumbre Iberoamericana. Los invito ahora a un paseo en mi maravilloso barco. Señores, vamos directo a una terrible tormenta. Tenemos que dar miedo. Fresco, Lula, gire a la derecha pronto. No, no, no. Este peón del imperio seguro que nos dirige a una emboscada. Dale para la izquierda. Que a la derecha le dé. Sí, ¡Qué foto, presidentes. <risa> Cuidado con la piedra. Upi chupi. Fue todo un sueño. ¿Dónde estoy? Nadie sabe, Evo. Nadie sabe. Pero tranquilo, mi amigo. Seguro que vendrán a rescatarnos. Tan pronto les hagamos falta. Si nos van a rescatar, nos, nos van a rescatar. Ellos vienen sí, ahora. Bien, seguro, bien, ¿Está seguro, señor? Nos vienen a rescatar ahora. Ya, ya.